So we're going to get started and people will, will trickle in. Um, first and foremost, welcome everyone to our 2020 election recap and thank you all for joining us. My name is Sydney Altfield and I'm the Director of Grassroots Engagement for Teach NYS and we are so honored to be joined by two incredible state legislators and our top lobbyist who will be giving us insight into what the political landscape of Albany will now look like post November election. I first want to thank Senator James Scoofus and Assemblymember Stacey Pfeffer Amato and Mike Avella for taking the time out of their very busy schedules to be here tonight. So thank you. With cases unfortunately on the rise in some areas and the Thanksgiving holiday in the next few days, I can only imagine how truly busy they, they all are. So on behalf of NYS and everyone tuning in tonight, we thank you. So thank you. Co-hosting tonight's event are two Teach NYS activists, Hannah Wolfson and Joey Braha. Unfortunately, Joey Braha was unable to make it tonight, but we are extremely lucky to have Morris Tavish in his place. Hana is a stellar activist from Long Island who has built an incredible relationship with assembly member Stacey Motto. And from Brooklyn, top activists Joey and Morris have developed the same with Senator James Scoopus. It is people like Hana, Morris, and Joey who are the true pillars of our organization and our non-public school community. So a big thank you to the three of you for assisting in putting together tonight's event, but also for your invaluable work year round. Thank you again. Before we dive in, I want to remind you that there is a question answer box to submit questions at the bottom. So please um, take the time to do so if you have questions and we'll get them answered. Now let's get into it. First, we have Teach NYS lobbyist, Mike Avella. Mike Avella was a counsel for the New York State Senate from 1995 to 2008. He most recently served as the chief counsel to the Senate majority under two majority leaders. In his capacity as the chief legal officer of the New York State Senate, he advised the majority leader and each member of the majority conference on every major policy initiative confronting the state. Mr. Avella is now a partner at Dickinson Avella PLLC, a firm that provides strategic advice to an array of nonprofits, labor unions, and businesses from startups to Fortune 100 companies in almost every industry. So before we get into the conversation with our amazing legislators, I want Mike to help set the stage with who won this election, who lost, what does that mean in Albany, and the trends that he saw um, going on with this election season. So I turn it over to you, Mike. Thank you, Sydney, and thank you everybody for joining us tonight. Um, I'm with the firm, as Sydney said, Dickinson Avello, but I'm working with uh, the Teach NYS Coalition for many years now, along with my colleague, Eglantina Haxelari, who is also on tonight. Um, we're proud to be here and talk with everyone. Um, and I, I do wanna say, while I will give a general overview, we are fortunate to have uh, the experts and two majority conference members in assembly member Pfeffer Amato and Senator Scoofus, who I'm sure could fill in any gaps that I leave out and correct me if I make any glaring errors. Um, th this election year, uh, as we all know, was uh, markedly different than previous elections for uh, many reasons, from the divisiveness on a federal level uh, to a global pandemic, to the incredible uh, increase in the use of paper ballots uh, in New York and uh, throughout the country. Um, the, the, going into this legislative election, which as everyone probably knows on, on this call here, every two years, every member of the New York State Legislature is up for election. Uh, we came into this election with strong Democrat majorities in both, both houses. And I don't want to, uh, the spoiler alert, we leave the election with strong Democrat majorities in both houses. But getting there was uh, kind of, and still is, a bit of a roller coaster. On election night, um, what we saw in New York was two uh, Republican leaders of the legislature and the Assembly and the Senate claiming tremendous Republican victories in a red, red wave uh, across New York State. Uh, and, and why did they do this? Well, they were looking at primarily because they were looking at election day results. And when you look at election day results, you generally have a pretty good idea of who won an election. 
while admittedly in New York State, every two years we have a straggler or two who doesn't get certified, you know, till the end of the year, sometimes into January, and there are seats that we're guessing on for some time. This year, there were dozens of such seats. What the Republican leaders did not take into consideration, either uh, intentionally or not intentionally, was that the incre incredible amount of paper ballots could swing these elections. And in previous years, when you saw election, uh, there was, we always had paper ballots, but the difference was there was not as many. And the difference also was you can usually count on paper ballots to generally follow the margins that you see on machines. So if somebody's up 10,000 votes on election night, they likely have won. If they're up 5,000, 2, even 2,000 or 1,000, very hard to close those gaps. But what we saw as we start, so before I get to that, so on election night, both leaders, Republican leaders were claiming they had tremendous victories. There were, um, I think, uh, potentially six uh, incumbent Democrats who uh, were thought to have lost a dozen plus uh, majority assembly members who were claimed to have lost once they started opening paper, not so incredibly, but incredibly, because we saw this around the country with the presidential election, the paper was breaking 60, 70, 75, 80, sometimes 80% for the Democrat candidates. Various reasons for that. One being leadership of both parties from the president on down was saying either don't vote on paper or do vote on paper. At the end of the day, you've had a, a, an overwhelming majority of Democrat votes on paper. So whereas we came out of election thinking that, and I'm focusing primarily on the Senate here because that has traditionally been a little more exciting, uh, pardon me, uh, assembly member, uh, than the assembly elections. Uh, but um, well, you had everyone from Long Island members, Jim Gorin to Kevin Thomas, the Monica Martinez, uh, you had Pete Harcum, you had Andrew Granardis in Brooklyn, all were claimed to have lost. To date, um, we, I think there is only one incumbent member of the uh, Senate Majority Conference who has conceded, and that's uh, Senator Metzger, who I believe officially conceded. You have uh, one or two races that are still unclear. But when we came into this election with a strong majority of 40 Democrats and 23 Republicans, we're likely going to leave right now, we have at least 42. So that's what's called a super majority. Uh, and that may grow by one or two seats. There's still a seat in upstate New York, which is expected to be flipped from Republican to Democrat. That would be 43. And then we have one or two, one on Long Island, which um, uh, Laura Ahern, who is a bit of a stretch for her to win, but she still possibly can close that gap. So what does that mean coming back with 42 members in the Senate? Well, the Assembly has been used to this because they've had a supermajority, you know, on and off for quite some time now. So the way uh, New York State Constitution and law works is that if you have two third members of the House, then you can override a veto of the governor. This is something that is not often used and used very judiciously um, over the years. Uh, although this cycle, we're in a much different cir circumstance because I don't believe that there have been two third or at least in my lifetime, uh, and, and probably most of us here, two thirds majorities in most um, both houses. So you only need the Democrats to override a, um, a veto of the governor. Practically, will that mean a slew of overrides? Who knows? I, I think what we're really more likely to see is uh, more uh, collaboration and cooperation on legislation because this certainly does give the legislature a, a little more influence in negotiations because the governor knows or should know in the back of his head that the legislature can override him if he doesn't come to a compromise and um, and 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 come to some agreed you know legislation. The other thing that happens with the supermajority is that the uh, assembly um, majority and the Senate majority now essentially um, completely control reapportionment. Uh, the, the, the way that reapportionment and independent redistricting commission was set up was that you needed Republican members of the commission to vote for a plan with a super majority, both uh, leaders can pass their own maps uh, going into redistricting. 
the assembly, we had a similar situation to what we saw in the Senate. There had to be about a dozen plus members who on election night um, were claimed to have lost. And these are members like you would never in a million years think like Michael Kusick and, and Steve Engelbright and, you know, Ed Braunstein and all these members who have been around and always fairly well, you know, win their elections. Um, all of that, I think, has either come to pass or will come to pass that those members will be retaining their seats. I think there may be one loss uh, one assembly uh, assemblywoman, uh, I believe Jaffe, may have conceded. Uh, assembly member, you can correct me if I'm wrong on that, but I think that might be the only one at this point. Nonetheless, we expect to see the assembly come back with at least 105 majority members and the Senate with at least 42 majority members, being the first time in recent history where you have a supermajority in both houses. I kind of rushed through that. Um, I don't know if there are any questions or you want me to touch on anything. The only other thing I could say is, you know, leadership positions and committee chairs, there likely will be some uh, shuffling around, um, not as much in the Senate, I would think, because you don't have incumbents having lost, you know, seats like um, you saw some vacancies and a lot of new members in the, in the assembly, primarily because of the, the primary elections and some retirements. Uh, but at this point, I am not aware of how they will be filling um, those committee chair. I don't know if anyone anyone is at this point, if leadership has made any decisions, but that's something we're going to keep a close eye on and, and we will inform you as the time goes on. So sorry to rush through. Uh, didn't want to take up too much time. I'll Perfect. just stop at this point. No worries. Perfect. That was a great overview of everything. And again, if anyone has questions, you can feel free to drop a question in the question answer and we will definitely answer it. Um, so thank you again, Mike, for all of that. There are definitely a lot of changes happening within Albany. Uh, so it's good to have a clear sense of what that all means. Um, so now I'm going to turn it to Hannah Wolfson to introduce um, the Assemblywoman. Hannah? Hi. Thank you, Sydney. Um, okay, so Stacey Pfeffer Amato is proud to represent the New York State Assembly's 23rd District. Stacey's mother, Queens County Clerk Audrey I. Pfeffer, previously held this assembly seat for over 25 years. And upon Stacey's election, they became the first mother-daughter team to hold the same seat in New York State Legislature, which is pretty awesome. Born in Rockaway, Stacey has a long-standing commitment to community advocacy and involvement. During her first year in office, Stacey was selected to participate in the 2017 National Early Learning Fellowship with the National Conference of State Legislatures. Her work as a fellow continues to focus on school readiness, family support, literacy, STEM, and other facets of early childhood education. Thank you, Hannah. Um, now, Morris, would you like to introduce the senator? Yes, thank, thank you, Sydney. So James Skoufis is the uh, senator for the 39th District in New York. He is a New York native, unlike me, who grew up in New Jersey, um, graduated from George Washington University and earned a master's from Columbia University right here in New York. During uh, Senator Skoufis' six years in the State Assembly, he fought for the Hudson Valley's working and middle class who are unfortunately often overlooked by government. Uh, Senator Skoufis has been a champion for better schools, stronger infrastructure, and leveling the playing field. James was elected to the state Senate in 2018, where he'll continue delivering results and serving us with integrity. Thank you, Morris, and thank you both for joining us. Um, so let's get right into it. And I hope that this isn't a question answer. It's more of a conversation. Um, and I know that this first question might be a little broad, but you guys can hone in on what you think is important in your mind also. Um, but what do you think the legislature is going to focus on, on this session? Who do you want to go first? Who, um, you, whoever wants to go first. Go right ahead, James. You jumped right in, so go. Okay. Well, well first, I want to I want to thank Teach NYS, and what, it's so great to see um, my former Assembly colleague, still my government colleague um, and friend, um, Assemblywoman Pfeffer Amato. It's great to see you. I miss seeing you and uh, not everyone in the Assembly, but a lot of uh, my old Assembly colleagues. Um, but you're definitely one of them. It's great to be here, and and look, you know. 
I think it behooves the legislature to focus on two very related things next year. And quite frankly, if, if these are not our two top priorities, I don't know where our heads are. But the first is obviously protecting the public health. You know, I Right now, as we speak on November 24th, I'd say about a third of my Senate district is in a yellow zone. Uh, I think uh, the Assemblywoman can speak to, I think there are some new zones um, in the outer boroughs in Long Island that have just uh, um, been proposed by the governor. And, and look, you know, we, the experts back in March, April, May, June, they told us this was happening. Uh, there was a second wave coming. I, and, you know, it wasn't TV heads, it wasn't politicians, it wasn't like your neighbor who watched a half hour YouTube and became a COVID expert. You know, we need to have been believing the public health experts who have told us all along this was coming. And uh, now look, the governor has a significant authority uh, during the state of emergency. We granted him those emergency powers, but the legislature still has a significant role to play. And uh, over the past many months, we've held hearings. Uh, we've done our own due diligence, certainly in our districts. We've been on the ground helping nonstop our communities. But uh, once, we, once we return to session, I think there are important bills we've got to take up related to nursing homes, hospitals. Certainly, we've got to deal with the massive financial gap uh, that, depending on how that shakes out, could have severe consequences. So protecting the public's health is paramount. And on a parallel track to that, very much related, is rebuilding our economy. Um, and when I, when I say that, I, I really mean we should specifically focus on rebuilding our small business economy, because the matter of fact is the Home Depots, the Walmarts of the world, they've done just fine and then some um, over the past seven months, eight months. And it's our main streets, it's our downtowns, it's our small businesses that are dying on a vine. Uh, and in the absence of federal, additional federal stimulus, additional PPP, uh, the state needs to do whatever we possibly can to put people back to work and to keep the doors open to our small businesses. But let me be clear, you can't do that if you don't first protect the public's health. If the virus spikes, if red zones pop up everywhere, everything locks down again. And we start back from, from, from zero and, you know, the progress we've made trying to rebuild is all gone. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the second can't happen without the first, but those are, I believe, what should be our two top priorities. Anything to add, Stacey? Oh, always, of course. But <laughs> first of all, I want to thank Teach um, New York, NYS for this conversation. I think it's very important. And one of the things in preparing, like the question just asked about um, what's our priorities, is having conversations like that. Because one, Senator you know, Skoufis and I, James, we could talk to each other, but we do have to listen to our constituents, to the communities, to hear what their priorities are. As much as we're trying our best to be everywhere, things are popping up all over. But James, I also miss you because you're a very smart legislator. And as a freshman, you were very kind. So yes, I agree with you. There's not some people I don't miss. So it's, it's nice to see you. Um, but that's what it's like. It's like a family, right? We all, all don't agree. And even our priorities, I would say I'm in line with what uh, Senator Skoufis just said. The public health is number one because we're still in it. You know, people are, what do they say, COVID fatigue and all these, you know, descriptions. No, I think we, we've been acting the same way all along as some others. And we have to keep our diligence up and protect our families and get through this winter because everything that the experts said is gonna be true. We're gonna be locked in, it's winter, it's gonna get worse. So that's number one. And I agree with that. Everything that we could do to protect health, to keep our hospitals um, not overwhelmed, to have people feel secure in these decisions and information very transparent. But my other priority, um, though small business, as I am a small business owner, in addition um, to being a legislator, I should say my husband, I shouldn't take any credit in that. I married into that business, um, is our schools. And that's appropriate to this conversation is our education because so many students are suffering with remote learning. Our special needs students, especially our poorer communities. You know, this is a crazy time for a parent to make a decision. Do I go to work or how can I go to work? They just locked down my school with what happened in the Far Rockaway community. We went into a red zone. We were the first group 
in the governor's like red zones. So schools, public and non-public schools were closed down. Parents were panicked what to do. So I think we have to look at the recovery from COVID and how we can get back on track with education, what the schools are gonna need, what we're gonna need in these COVID times to continue the education as best we could when we go back, I think we'll eventually go back onto remote. And how do we support that? And then when we get back to, when we get to the other side, what do we need to keep our standards where we, um, where we were? We fought hard for STEM money. We fought hard for security money. We fought um, for all of our schools, if it's public, charter, um, private, and get ourselves back on that track and not hoping with this $50 billion budget deficit that's proposed or more, that we don't look at cuts. So the other priorities we have to look at is our revenue track and what we're gonna look at. Um, Mike, I wanna to say to you, that was a great overview. I actually was excited about my job. I'm listening to all of our priorities and the outcomes. It was quite good, but what we that's something we have to work on is one, our leadership. And when we get there in the assembly, we had a lot of changes. A lot of key committee chairs um, were not elected um, and we're gonna, there's gonna be a lot of shuffling. But one thing that won't shuffle is our priorities. We are the people's house. And we will always focus on that and make sure that we keep our priorities in check. But I do think we're in some hard times. And I really hope, you know, this conversation, one of many, to be real about what we're talking about. Because when there's no money in the pot, you can't pay the bills. So we have to acknowledge the fact that we are going to be short on cash. And what, what are our priorities going to be? And it's going to be tough. This is not going to be easy. Um, James definitely has more... Um, years under his belt, but no one has seen a deficit like this in years. So there'll be a lot of this conversations, a lot of advocacy going on out there. And uh, my goal is to make sure that we get ourselves in a moving forward uh, direction. And it might hurt a little bit, but we're always, we just have to keep moving forward. I just want to tack on one thing that Stacy said that's very important. And that's the, the science around in-person learning, in-classroom learning has evolved since the, since the beginning here, right? Everyone was frenetic coming out of the summer. Oh my God, what's gonna happen once kids are back in classrooms and on top of each other? And that's gonna be, you know, all of our months long of work and effort bringing down these numbers are gonna explode again. And, you know, just a few nights ago, um, you have Dr. Fauci on TV saying that the safest place for kids right now is oftentimes, almost all the times, based on the data, in the classroom. And so every effort does need to be made to get kids back in the classroom with all the precautions and safety protocols uh, in the school buildings. But, you know, it, it's important, whether we're legislators or regulators, uh, mayors, that we don't get stubborn and stick to old science because decisions were made four, five, six months ago. The The environment has changed and we've got to be driving these decisions with public health and the school issue, the in-person in learning issue is, uh, is really key. So I'm glad that Stacy brought that up. But I agree with you. I think that we, you know, the schools, did, you know, let me stop again. We trust our school leadership, right? And they took every precaution to the umpteenth power to make sure that our children were safe. So I'm proud of all the schools that I represent that they did that. And I agree with you that in-person is the best and the science proves it. And that should be the goal. And I'll say it, I think the mayor hastily jumped quickly to close the schools in New York City. And it put it, what happens every time one of our leadership uh, in the leadership make a decision, it has such a ripple effect. When he made that announcement to close the schools, hundreds of phone calls. Again, parents are worried how they're gonna get to work. What does that look like at home? You know, it's great to think that everybody has a good home but some kids are just literally safe, physically safer being in school. And I think that's a great goal that I'd love, you know, we'll, we'll partner with that way to make sure that we can keep schools open as much as possible. Now, of course, if we get to these, some of these crazy numbers, uh, I was reading this morning about Staten Island and I hate to call out my colleagues there, uh, but it's spiking. So it might be that balance with being home for a couple of weeks to get a grip on it, but then the goal should be to get the children back into school. I think it's healthy for the family, it's certainly most important for the kids. So, yep, great, great ideas together. Look, we're solving all the problems right here. Right on the Zoom. In the Zoom where it happens, as they like to say. 
Um, so that goes perfect into our next question, um, talking about COVID and relief and, and what that's going to look like. Um, what do you anticipate happening with co federal COVID relief for the state of New York, but specifically the non-public school arena? Do you, do you want to go first? Sure, I think, yeah. I, sure thanks. I think that being that you know, Biden won the White House, I, I feel that we'll have a better chance of getting some federal dollars into New York uh, State. I mean, uh, the president, current president now, he really basically threatened that we would get no funding. So I feel better about that there'll be a good flow. It's just a matter of how many pots can we fill, right? But there are certain things that are absolutely the federal government uh, to take care of us with. And that goes into some education programs. It certainly goes into a lot of the food programs. I mean, we could talk about food insecurity, what's happening to see the modern times that people are going hungry. So I think we have a better opportunity to really secure what we need. I think it's strategic. You know, I mean, there's a lot of programs out there, but we have to make sure that our schools get the federal money, the lunch money is there um, and issues like that. And then it'll be on our, on our part. But I do think that we, definitely a one step closer to securing some good cash. Yeah, regardless of, I completely agree, regardless of whether you support Biden or Trump, I, and certainly, you know, the majority of the Orthodox community did lean towards Trump this past election, but let's, let's be real, in terms of uh, getting assistance to New York State, as we're trying to come to grips with the financial catastrophe that our state government and local governments are facing, um, Biden offers more optimism in that regard. Um, you know, even just uh, Biden was on, I think it was NBC, his first live interview was tonight. And uh, he acknowledged that, uh, so yes, you've got to make the decision of, okay, school buildings open or close, but he acknowledged one of the challenges is, besides even sort of the politics and the public policy decision-making, one of the challenges is it costs $200 billion nationally to put all the safety measures in place to be able to get everyone back into classrooms. And, you know, he indicated that's got to be a priority uh, of getting schools this money uh, this, during these emergency times to sanitize classrooms and, you know, put up plexiglass and do everything they need to do to get kids back into school buildings. And as it pertains to New York State government, look, depending on who you ask exactly, we're in the ballpark of about a $14 billion deficit. We passed a balanced budget on April 3rd. That has happened since April 3rd as a direct result of COVID. Businesses are closed, we don't get sales tax revenue. People get laid off, we get less personal income tax revenue. DMVs are closed, we don't get any DMV fee revenue. And so that amounts to about $14 billion. And unlike the federal government, when they run out of money, they can just print more money. We don't have that printing press in Albany. And so we're actually constitutionally obligated to maintain a balanced budget. And we are desperate for federal assistance. And the Biden administration, the incoming administration, has made it very clear. They've signaled that this is a paramount priority for them, is getting more stimulus. And as part of that stimulus, a big hunk of it being for state and local governments so that we don't have to go through, and this is not hyperbole, so that we don't have to go through a second recession. If we don't get assistance and, you know, our two options are then either raise taxes or cuts. There's no magic third door to balance a budget. Um, and if we have to go down the road of cuts, either in full or part, which I want to avoid uh, at the utmost, then we're talking about laying off, God knows, tens if not hundreds of thousands of public employees, maybe even more than that. Local governments, they're the folks that employ our police departments, our fire departments, the the, the sanitation folks who pick up our trash, you know, you name it, those are our neighbors and those, that's the repercussion of cutting either from our state budget or not getting federal aid. And so we're, we're desperately in need of it. I think that there's lots of reason to be more optimistic now than two and a half, three weeks ago before the election. Um, and I think there's also a chance now that during the lame duck session in Congress before Biden, uh, enters office, we're going to see a stimulus because if I'm Mitch McConnell in the U.S. Senate and I'm seeing Joe Biden, this is my top priority, well, maybe I want to pass the stimulus now with Trump still in the White House so that it has more of a Republican flavor than 
if Joe, if we don't do anything, then Joe Biden pushes for it in January and February. So fingers crossed, we need it. And if we don't get it, um, I do, I, I echo what Stacy mentioned. And, and that is, I, I think our, our first best bet is to try and mitigate cuts uh, and raise some revenue from folks who quite frankly, uh, weren't hurting from the pandemic. They did just fine. Great. And I know we touched a little bit on the keeping STEM funding, security funding, all of that, and trying to keep that um, at the same level. Um, but I want to talk about, you know, we're in trying keeping that at the same level or, or do whatever we can with that. But in terms of non-public school, um, you know, relief and funding for when this comes down, do you see this priority to um, both of your um, both of your um, houses? And do you see that the legislature is aware of the um, of the what's happening in the non-public school community in sense of shelling out a lot of money to make sure that their kids are, in, are safe and their own nurses and their own testing and this and that? Um, do you think that they're aware of that? And is that something that will be a priority to them as well as the public education and the non-public education? Yeah. So, so look, I think we can safely say that two of us on this call um, want to avoid at all costs uh, cuts to education, including the STEM uh, program, uh, which has been wildly successful, as I'm sure all of you on this call are aware. Um, and and look, you know, just just to reinforce the point and actually complete the point I was making before. Um, if you do not support, as a legislator, we just went through campaigns, there's lots of political rhetoric during campaigns. If you don't support as a candidate or a legislator raising some new revenue, then that means you're for cuts. And let me be, some, let me be very clear here. Two thirds of our state budget, two thirds is education and healthcare. You cannot close a 10 plus billion dollar deficit without cutting education health care. So for all those candidates who are running around, not a, not a dime of new taxes, I don't care if you're you know, a multimillionaire, but we're not raising, then that means that they're for cutting health care and education because you can't make the cuts without touching those two sectors of our budget. They're so large. And so, so look, um, I think it's the will of most, if not almost all, maybe all, of the majority conference in the state Senate uh, to avoid cuts to education uh, at all costs. Um, it is something that is uh, very near to our conference's heart. I know coming from the assembly, uh, the vast majority of the majority members um, feel the same way. And, uh, and look, that means we've got to find money. You know, it's, uh, and, and let's be real, there's no scenario by which we're gonna cut public school funding and not cut STEM funding or other non-public school funding. And so we're all in this together. When we're talking about education and what lies ahead in the coming months. Let's not be pitting what, one against the other because if one's cut, I guarantee you the other's gonna be cut. If one is not cut, chances are the other is not gonna be cut. So we're all in the same boat here when it comes to education, public and non-public, as we're dealing with this fiscal crisis. And uh, I'm hopeful that if we're putting together a list of 100 items to cut, this is you know, not even on the list if it is, it's number 100. And hopefully we can avoid most, if not all those uh, on the list by getting some federal help and raising some revenue. And so let me just tell you about how I feel about STEM. I've been to many of my schools in the classrooms watching STEM firsthand, you know, watching um, the young ladies for the first time doing robotics. What I watched them engage in the conversation and their whole language and, and interest they didn't know they had. So I will fight tooth and nail to not let a dime get, you know, decreased from STEM. Because once you give that opportunity, you can't change it. And it's going right on what James was saying that um, we're not going to allow it in a sense that we're going to advocate for that. We know we're on the call for a reason. So it, you can't tell me you're going to cut public school. I mean, only cut non-public school and not pu public school, right? We have to go in this together. And we know education is the one investment that we really can't play with. It's not to say, you know, it's horrible because we have to think about seniors, veterans, children, education, but the one commitment is education. And it's across the board, it's a universal conversation. So those are our priorities. So if so, if you, to ask me my priorities in the assembly, 
would be make, to make sure education doesn't lose any money. Because I think there's some places that might have to get cut or trim the fat, as you would say, and looking at that. But that's an area that you can't, certainly because of this pandemic, and we know how many kids have fell behind. Not, you know, not to say public versus private, but there's been uh, an effect. And what's that gonna be? Is it gonna be in mental health? So we have to add more mental health support or is it in just basic math? That math was very hard to do, learning with your teacher through remote learning. So there's gonna be other investments, other expenses that are gonna come up that we don't know of yet because we're not out of the pandemic, we're still facing it. So what is the post pandemic look like in education? And I think we have to prepare. And I think the jobs that we have now is to make those lists, to know what each school has spent, what has the pandemic cost our non public schools. So we're ready, proactive. I, I would rather see us proactive and have our advocacy points to go into this than be reactory. And going into revenue, and I don't know if that'll be a question out there, absolutely. There's so many creative ideas out there um, and ideas that people might fundamentally not agree with, but we should look at where the money is and, and try to raise revenue before ever making cuts. And I'm a supporter of that. But some of the ideas I don't love, but I know that I'd rather go forward than ever make a cut. And that's what James was saying too. Well, thank you all. You both set the stage for the questions that we have coming in. So um, now we'll turn over to our two hosts who have some of the questions that they're going to ask. Um, and I will let them start off. Hannah, go ahead. Okay, so the first question that came in, um, how will the state focus resources of closing achievement gaps already witnessed for remote learners? Stacy, you did touch upon it a little bit in the very beginning, but um, just if you can expound on that a little bit. I think we're gonna have to rely, you know, we're gonna rely on our teachers to help us to under identify what those gaps are. But it's gonna be, I think there's gonna be a little period of time at, at the end of this, the post, to evaluate what our students need because everyone's gonna be at a different, everyone's at a different learning level. Everyone learns differently. So go back into your fourth grade class and um, our young man, he's doing great in his reading, but his math is struggling. Now look at our young lady, you know, how do we bring that with the class, every, you know, everyone in the class is not on the same level and what will we do? I think we're, that's what I'm saying, we're gonna have to look at what we have to invest in. Will it be more tutoring? Will it be more special resource rooms to identify that. You know, I, I think there'll be a lot, we're gonna depend on our administrators. A lot of you don't know that I was a paraprofessional before, and I think the whole school family is gonna to have to participate, and our teachers, and our paras, and our lunchroom ladies, they're also gonna to have to recover from this. So I think we're gonna to have to offer a lot of counseling and support to our school family to help our families get back on track together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I completely agree. And, you know, something that um, we as legislators, if we're doing our job, we're, we're oftentimes doing more listening than talking. And I think this is one area, given how unprecedented it is, that we have to do a lot of listening and, um, and hear from our, our educators. And certainly we've been doing that um, over the past couple of months. Um, but one thing I'll add that has become very clear is there are some disadvantaged households and, and broader communities that don't have computers, that don't have internet. And, you know, I'm in Rockland, Orange, and a little tiny bit of Ulster counties. Um, I'm fortunate that just about all of my territory has broadband. You go a little bit further north, they don't have mm -hmm. internet, you know, by how we define internet these days, high-speed internet. Um, and, you know, city of Newburgh, which I represent, you have households that you don't have laptops. They can't do this. Um, and so, so yeah, you know, the, what, one of the, the many byproducts of this awful pandemic is that it has uh, really exasperated, um, uh, if not certainly exposed, uh, the inadequacies uh, that exist in public policy and in society. Um, and this is definitely one of them. The, the achievement gap is glaring uh, when it comes to remote learning. Um, and no doubt it, it is being exasperated. And if I could add on that, and I would say special education, because it's always been in the city, it's always been underfunded, 
There's tons of kids not getting their services. There's folks that get services provided through the city um, council of special education in our non-public schools, and they're not getting their services in the same way. And a lot of kids, again, can't go that way. So that gap is gonna be huge. And that stress level has totally been on our parents um, in the sense of kids not be, you know, going into school at all. So that's gonna be another area that we're gonna to have to identify, which has always been underfunded. So again, it goes back to the money and the funding. So what is that going to, what's that cost? And are we willing to fund it? But that's the other area that we're going to have to look at that. So, so mm -hmm. on, on the topic of funding, um, what levers do officials see gaining traction amongst their colleagues to, uh, you know, as, as, as you both spoke before, to adjust the budget and raise new revenue without hurting the state economy at the same time? Well, I'm a believer. Um, so I think there's some great ideas to raise uh, revenue. And I, and I think we have to really look at that. That's the conversation, what we could do. I'm a believer. Uh, I should believer. I support like sports betting. I mean, if you like it or not, let's just understand that people are spending their money in Pennsylvania, Connecticut, and New Jersey. You don't have to agree with gambling. You could be completely against gambling. But I would like everyone to acknowledge that people do do it, they do it responsibly, and they're doing it out of New York State. So we're letting that money leave our, our state. And, and again, it's, again, it could be morally or something that you don't like, but that's money that goes to education. That's revenue that can come into our state without raising anyone's taxes. It goes with every responsibility. You know, we could talk about marijuana. Um, is that something we want to explore? Again, this is very tough topics. I'm being very transparent here because I don't know how I feel on it, but I have to acknowledge that other states are making a lot of money and do I want to cut or do I want to raise revenue? And we're adults and it's adult choices. We are allowed to drink. You know, there's, it's something we have to kind of level the plane on and get around. Again, I don't say it easily, but I, I saw the numbers that sports betting, how much money we lost New York City and New York State for money that's leaving. So that's just one idea of, might have not thought about it two years ago, but now I'm really going to think about it because I don't want to cut ever, anything. So that's one idea. And I don't know, you know, James, if you want to jump, jump on another. Yeah, no, I, I, think, I, I think those ideas are um, right on point. We have to be creative. Um, you know, the, one of the sort of bedrock proposals that's out there, if we are talking taxes, um, that I think there's some coalescing around, uh, though there's not unanimity among Senate Democrats, is um, a temporary two-year, basically a COVID surcharge on um, earners uh, who are fortunate enough to make more than $5 million annually um, in New York State. Um, and, and look, you know, the way I frame this, there, there are some colleagues who are just like, tax the rich, you know, let's soak them for all they're worth. And, and I think that's a very dangerous road to, to travel down. The way I frame this is we are in a, a, an unprecedented state of emergency here. We need those very, very fortunate in our society to do the patriotic thing so that we can, we can avoid cuts to hospitals, avoid cuts to schools. We need you right now to pay just a little bit more. We're talking two or three percentage points in your personal income tax for a couple of years to get us through this crisis. And that proposal I think comes in, uh, clocks in at somewhere around $4 billion in new revenue annually. Um, so that gets us maybe close to a third of the way uh, in the absence of any federal assistance. And I think um, online sports betting is something that uh, we ought to look at. It's something that I think that, you know, has quite a bit of support in, in the Senate and the Assembly. The governor has raised constitutional questions around that issue, which I think are, is a straw man argument, but, you know, we'll have that conversation. Um, there's talk about, uh, so New York City is due to, to get casinos in 2023. That was always part of the agreement from when the upstate casinos started a number of years ago. Um, and, you know, I think a worthy idea is to accelerate the licenses for those casinos. Don't let them open the doors still until 2023, but award the licenses now. Each license is valued at by the industry, not by politicians, by the industry, a half a billion dollars each. 
We're talking two licenses for New York City. That's a billion dollars. And so all these, you know, hundreds of millions, billion here, billion there begins to add up. And, uh, you know, that's how we avoid making cuts to STEM and education and all these programs uh, that we care about. Um, and, uh, and so, look, I, the one thing I'll just end with is that there are a lot of proposals out there to tax the very wealthy in New York. The one thing we have to just be mindful of, I do not believe you see flight of wealth if we increase uh, five plus million earners personal income tax rates. percent. That's not going to drive people out of you know, the greatest state in the country. They live here for a reason. Most of them live in New York City for a reason. And there's subways and Broadway when it reopens. And it's, you know, a magical place. And their kids go to some fancy private schools. They don't want to pick up their stakes and relocate and have to start their lives all over again mm -hmm. somewhere over a 2% increase in a personal income tax. But if you do that, plus tax their stocks, plus tax their second homes, plus tax, you know, the oxygen they breathe, you know, <laughs> then they're going to pick There's up a breaking their stakes point and, eventually. And, and go to New Jersey. So there right. is a threshold, but I, I, I do believe that we can make the modest, modest, and I believe patriotic ask, hey, we need a little bit more from you and your personal income taxes so we can, we can rebuild and avoid these cuts. But I think Thank that's you. being creative, right? I think that's something that we have this opportunity, like you said, it's unprecedented times. Why don't we just have this pause or the more discussions, and I'm willing to do it within my house, and I know you would be, to have these more creative ideas. I mean, I think paying that two-year, like I live in a co-op, so if the elevator breaks, we get an assessment for two years. At the end of it, we have a new elevator. So let's pay a little bit at the end of two years, have a new seat, be back on, be resilient, be out there. But I mean, I think you have to kind of, I think we have a great opportunity to be creative except, instead of screaming tax, 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 uncreative. So I just do think we could think out of the box. And, and I, so I appreciate this conversation with the whole panel and, and, and everyone listening. I just think that we could do better. And, and I'll put whatever hours in the day it takes because you don't want to see those cuts. And when I, at the end of this, it would be great for a story to end 2020 or the end of the pandemic to say that we came out stronger and better. And some industries are going to close. Look, we're not even touching on healthcare. And, and to yay for all our, our frontline mm -hmm. workers and our nurses. And my whole family went for COVID tests today. I mean, talking, talking, talking. And we haven't even talked about that yet, but there has to be, we have to do better and be more creative. And whatever time it takes, I'm a fighter. I'll last as long as it takes. We have to come out with the most creative outcome. And I say that for you, James, too. You know, that's the nitty gritty we have to get into. That's why conversations like this, but it can't just be tax, tax, tax. Because even as middle class, we always talk about that the middle class gets hurt. And you will. Because when you we started off, you talked about small businesses, right? Small businesses, we're taxed as a corporation and you're taxed as an individual, depending on how you set up your business. 40 years, my husband's in a business. Let's just take this for an example. And, and you're looking at the wealth of it. But that's 40 years of investing every dime we've ever had and our blood, sweat, and tears of seven years. And then all everyone wants to do is tax a corporation, not understanding that we're 16 employees or small corporations. Yes, Amazon, Exxon, let's talk about those. But we have to be careful when we talk about small businesses and what a small business is in New York State. 50 employees, those are usually local jobs, local well-paying jobs, but we're so quick to tax corporations. A lot of your businesses on Main Street are corporations. Corporations are how you uh, structure your taxes for your business. So I think we have to open up that conversation too to really be creative, how to get mainstream strong again. And those are ways that we could do it. Absolutely. Perfect. We have two questions. Mm -hmm. um, we'll do Morris's next and we'll end with Hannah's question. Okay. So uh, Stacey, thank you for that last bit on small businesses. As a fellow small business owner, I agree wholeheartedly. Um, okay. So to change topics and address an elephant in everybody's room right now. Um, do we see the state going back into a total lockdown or do you think we're going to stay in the, the new micro zone format, red, orange, yellow? And can you expand a little bit on the plans for the near future? You want to take that one first? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, near future. So the near future is, is Thanksgiving, right? Let's just do what's in front of us. Right. And I'm concerned that Thanksgiving will be Halloween 2.0.
because they talked about Halloween and the parties and uh, not wearing masks and gatherings and, you know, a party on Long Island that broke out to be a super spreader and then rumors in other communities we have to talk about that there were big weddings and so I'm hoping that we learn and people are going to approach Thanksgiving um, more responsible, like-minded. You know, when the governor made his suggestion of, you know, no more than 10 people, people went berserk. Come on. It's a suggestion. It's like-mindedness. We're going to be six people. We all went for COVID tests because my son came home from college, and that is cootie land up there. And in state colleges because the kids are on top of each other all over the place. So even though we had a COVID test on the exit, we made him get a rapid test today because we want to take extra precaution. I have a compromised family member. So that's the near future. I think if we can get our holidays in check, mass sanitizer, limit there, you know, I think we could do better and maybe we could stick to those micro zones. However, thank you, Hannah, for mentioning my mother, who's the county clerk of Queens. They're sort of going to a skim down um, approach to the courtrooms. They were going two weeks on, two weeks off, and they're lessening the employees. They're preparing to get everyone sort of working from home, lessening it so that the blow won't be as hard as it was in March. Do I think we're going to lock down the state? I, I'm so a half glass full person. I feel like we're going to partially be there. I think it's going to be inevitable if our behaviors don't change. And being inside in the science backs that. Now, I don't want it, so I do everything. I don't want it. I do everything within my office, my personal behaviors, our business, everything we could to not spread COVID. And I think that this micro yellow zones is like the first warning, like whoop, whoop, whoop. We had a really high red in Far Rockaway, but we did everything. Connie, you know, we spoke about it. Schools were closed, but after two mm -hmm. weeks, we were so low. We were nowhere near where everyone else is. So I think if everyone gets that warning light, which James, you said a lot of your area is getting to that orange, I think that's the caution light. And if everyone reacts and then withdraws, I, I think it's 50-50. I, I can't predict because I thought really when Far Rockaway got hit, I was really concerned. But when everyone's behavior went to check and kind of regrouped, we came out beautiful on the other side. All the schools were reopened, businesses were reopened. So it goes down to human nature. Do you believe or don't you believe? We can go back to a whole debate on that, but I, I don't know. I just pray we don't. Yeah, I, I would just add that I think um, I think probably every single elected leader in New York State uh, is intent on on having that be the absolute last resort. Um, you know, I, I think if there is a colleague in government who thinks that it should not be the last resort, then they ought to reconsider their line of work. Um, the, the pain that's associated with a complete lockdown is unfathomable. Um, you know, but we decide whether we lock down. I have no idea whether we're going to go into a full lockdown or not. I sure as hell hope we don't. Um, but we decide whether we do. Um, look, no one's going despite sort of the memes and the ridiculousness of, uh, of the executive order. No one's going door to door to check if you have 10 or 11 people at your Thanksgiving table in a couple of days. Um, you know, I've seen the uh, sort of the, what are they called? The stickies that you put on your window with the governor's head, uh, sort of checking in uh, on your dining room and they're hysterical. But, but look, I, I like to think that that is meant not to, again, you know, it's unenforceable. It's, it's impossible to right. enforce that. But hopefully it gets people thinking. Hopefully it just makes folks mindful of the fact that maybe I shouldn't have 20 people with grandma and grandpa around the table uh, who are 80 years old uh, with everything that's going on. We decide whether this state locks down or not in the coming months. We decide mm -hmm. by virtue of whether we wear masks, whether we're congregating in groups, whether we're smart about this. If we are, then we're not going to lock down again. If we're stupid about it, then the odds increase significantly. So I, I sure hope we don't. I think every good elected official, um, you know, is is doing whatever they can to make that be the absolute last resort. I agree. Thank you. Thanks. So um, just from our conversation tonight, we kind of have an idea. But what are your priorities for the upcoming legislative session? 
Yeah, so I, I, I really touched on this. I think it was the first question. Um, you know, my, my, type, my top priorities are what I think the legislature should be focusing on, um, protecting people's lives and, uh, and rebuilding the economy. Um, and, and look, you know, I'm fortunate enough to be chair of the investigations committee. Uh, we held over 40 hours of hearings um, on the state's COVID response a couple of months ago with a particular focus on hospitals, nursing homes and workplaces. Uh, we've developed um, pretty robust legislative packages of bills uh, around those issues that I, I think it behooves us to consider and, and hopefully pass. Uh, we need to, as a legislature, yes, the governor has a lot of uh, emergency power, but we as a legislature um, need to glean what happened uh, back in March, April, May, and do our part to put guardrails in place, protections in place, whatever you want to call them, so that I, as we enter now a second wave, we reduce the number of fatalities to as low a number as possible. And we do have a role to play in that. The governor can't, uh, can't enact a lot of this stuff by, uh, by executive fiat that I'm referring to. So, uh, so you know, that's, uh, that's a those are my top priorities. And, and look, you know, there are sort of sub priorities. When I talk about getting people back to work and rebuilding the economy, next year, we're supposed to be negotiating a new DOT capital program. Typically they're five years long. I might not be five years long given our financial constraints if Congress doesn't come through. Um, but like, that's an easy way to get people back to work, spend money on infrastructure, rebuild our infrastructure. Um, Make sure, you know, as we're talking about getting people back to work, we need to make sure that we don't lay off people. That means making sure we don't cut from schools. If we cut schools, they're laying off teachers. If we cut county governments, local governments, they're laying off DPW workers and social workers, and you name it. And so, um, so, you know, when I talk about these two priorities, it really, they touch on everything. But those are the two themes that I'll, I'll be focused on. I agree completely. I, I think... The main concern right now in front of us is still COVID. And, and James, you said that from the beginning, like we're in the second wave. It didn't stop and come back. And so what's been predicted is here. So in, once we get through that, we have to recover from it. And it's exactly what you said, James. It's, it's, our, it's our economy. It's making sure that our health infrastructure is solid. Um, in my community, we have one hospital. It's a safety net hospital. They're proposing cuts to that. Um, that's a big problem. So it's sort of saying, and I said this, I touched on this saying like having, knowing what we need, right? So is it hospital money for our healthcare, our education? And then we can go forward and plan because like the capital plan five year, we're gonna have to make like a 10 year plan and, and stick to it to know how we're gonna spend on infrastructure, how we're gonna invest in our small businesses or not. And maybe that's where a tax break or something comes through there. Um, again, our education, you know, not be so quick to make cuts and kind of have a slow and steady pace. But until we come out of COVID to really know the damage, because right now I feel like my shoulders are up and I'm tense. So I'm not really focused past COVID. I think once mm -hmm. we're done, well, once the vaccines start happening and we start vaccinating and that'll be a whole nother debate because we went through the, the measles, um, that was a good time in the assembly, let me say that. So when we start talking about the COVID vaccine, and I'm, that's what I've been reading about, two out of three New Yorkers said they will get it. Once we start getting down that road, our shoulders will drop, we'll breathe a little bit, and then I think we can focus on how to bring us back. But it's really just going along the pace. You know, when we passed our budget and we dropped anything that had money, um, April 3rd, we did so many bills, again, out, not just from the governor's executive order, what we could do in our houses, to uh, relieve, um, relieve some of the pressures of COVID, help our economy boom, make sure this group is protected, that group. That's what our priorities are gonna be. It's gonna surface as soon as we can kind of take an exhale and then we'll know what we can do with the legislature to a little band-aid, a little moving forward. But it's really complicated until we kind of get our budget numbers, not complicated, but I think there's so many, but we everything to be touched on. It's gonna be have to be like, um, not a broad stroke, but it's going to be multitasking to, to, to the tenth power again on that because mm -hmm. we'll have to juggle and do that. You know, I think they'll keep. I think what we, you could do, Hannah, and in the groups and your advocacy is also let us see what's out there because we're not always able to see what's affecting our communities and 
what Teach New York State does so well, NYS, is really bring not just the you know non-public school issues specifically. I mean, we talked about feeding, you know, food justice and making sure there's right food in all the schools. So you do set your own priorities and that helps us set the priorities, right? Because you represent so many people. So that's where uh, we're, we'll always rely on you for a clear message and I appreciate it all the time. So thank you. Perfect. Um, well, we're getting it down to that final moment. Um, there were a few questions that we didn't get to, but we have them written down and we'll make sure that we get them answered. Um, I just wanted to, again, thank the Assemblywoman, the Senator, Mike, um, for all of the incredible insight tonight. It is a true treat to have heard from all of the people who live and breathe this every day. Um, so thank you again. And thank you to our co-hosts, Hannah and Morris, for your steadfast commitment to the future of Jewish education. Um, and thank you all for joining us tonight. We hope you are excited for the legislative session come January 2021. Um, and to get more involved with Teach NYS, please be in touch with us and have a happy, healthy, and um, fun Thanksgiving. Thank you. Have thank a good you night. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Thank you, James and Stacey. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Uh, happy Thanksgiving.